Deuteronomy chapter 21 in the Word of God tonight. <clears throat> Going to be teaching you on the value of life. And these, uh, this chapter and these verses. We're going to go all the way to chapter 22 and verse 12. And you're going to see many, many laws. <clears throat> quite a few laws here in this section. But this is falling into the category of the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not kill, okay, or thou shalt not murder. And so what we see in this section is God is telling, showing his people how to fulfill that command of thou shalt not murder or thou shalt not kill. So he emphasizes life, that we should not cheapen it. We should not abuse life. We should not disrespect life. We should not mistreat life. Amen. So it's very important for us to see what we're about to see. And it's going to shock you how some of this fits in. Amen. Amen. But the value of life. Chapter 21, uh, verse 1. If one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in a field, and it be not known who has slain him, then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure Unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man. Even the elders of that city. Shall take a heifer which hath not been wrought with. That means worked with. And which hath not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of the city shall bring down the heifer. Unto a rough valley which is, in the, uh, which is neither eared nor sown. And shall strike off the heifer's neck. There in the valley. And the priests the sons of Levi shall come near. For them the Lord thy God had chosen to minister unto him. See these ministries? They're called to come near to God. Because God has chosen them to minister. And the Bible says, And by their words shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. They shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed. And lay not innocent blood unto the people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, when, you, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. So real fast, you're going to see something here. We talk about the value of life. You're going to see a story about a murdered man. You're going to see a story about a captive woman. You're going to see a story about two wives, one that's hated and one that's loved. And how the birthright should be handled in relationship to that. You're going to see a story about a rebellious son. You're going to see a story about one that is hung upon a tree. And then chapter 22, you're going to see some teaching on animal life. You're going to see also teaching on uh, a scripture that teaches against transgenderism. And you're going to see some teaching on the future, uh, future life in relationship to a mother bird. The building of a border on the top of the house. Not mixing seeds and also wearing a garment called the tassels. So these are the things you're going to be seeing, seeing tonight. All right. In the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. I ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word. Give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> okay. The first part of this section here then deals with a man who has been murdered. And somebody comes across him. He's in the field. And obviously that he didn't just die of natural causes. So whoever found the man in the field has determined that this man was murdered, that he was slain. But nobody saw who killed him. Nobody saw the murderer. He didn't, nobody saw it happen. They don't know when it happened, how it happened. They don't know who did it. But because life is so important and so valuable... Because man was created in the image of God. God says if you, if you find a man in the field that's been murdered. Even though you don't know who did it. You didn't see it. You don't know how it happened. He said what you got to do is you have to measure 
from where that man is lying to the nearest city. And the nearest city becomes responsible for that dead man. Now think about that. What God is saying, even though nobody knows who did it, how it happened, etc. You just got a dead man that's been murdered because life is so important. We want to make sure that you understand that life must be respected. And so God says, you measure to the closest city. And then the elders of the city are going to come out. And they're going to offer a sacrifice there. They're going to kill a heifer. They're going to cut its head off, maybe, or just cut its neck. I don't totally understand that statement. But anyway, they're going to slay that heifer. And they're going to make a sacrifice or an atonement for the death of that man. Okay? And so that's what they do. They measure. They determine the closest city. The elders come out. And they kill that heifer so that there would be no blood guiltiness on the nation of Israel. What God is showing you here is the value of life. How God looks at life. Even a murdered man that nobody saw it happen. Nobody knows when it happened. Who did it? They don't have those facts. But because God values life. He said we got to make atonement for the death of this man. And so that's what they do. Now how does that apply to us today as a church? Well, if you find somebody that's in the street and they've died. They've been slain. Are you going to take a red heifer out there and you're going to kill that red heifer? And say, God, you know, I don't want to be guilty of the death of this man. How do you spiritually apply that to the church today? It has been applied it, throughout history in church, at church, in church history at times to winning souls. So that if you have an individual that, let's say, they die, they perish, they go to hell. Because life is so important in the eyes of God. It has been preached that God will measure the distance from where that man perished to the nearest city called the church. And he will hold that, that, that church as a spiritual city responsible for not witnessing to that man. Even though that church may not have been guilty, uh, specifically guilty in the perishing or the dying or the, the lostness of that man. The fact that that church did not put the necessary effort forth to try to win that man to God. And he perished and went to hell. So think about that. Our church today, we, we have people around us. Have we witnessed to them? Have we knocked the doors of the, of the you know, surrounding houses here? Have we knocked those doors? Have we done what we could do to try to win people to God? Have we witnessed to them? And not only that, but what about each of us individually who are rubbed shoulders with other people? And we rub shoulders with other people and we feel the, the urging of the Holy Spirit of God for us to witness to those people because we know they're dying and going to hell and we don't say one word to them. And so if we don't fulfill the responsibility, we not, might not be directly Guilty of their perishing. But God says, you were the closest one to them. And you didn't witness to them. So there's blood guiltiness on your hands. See? And it's also a picture of the pastor too. Because if the pastor doesn't stand up and declare the word of God to you. Then your blood is on his hands. How many people, brothers and sisters... Has God put us close to in contact with. And we did not witness to them. And they died and they're in hell tonight. And on judgment day. God's, God is going to look at us and say. This man or this woman died. And they perished. And you didn't do anything about it. Now I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on us. I can tell you this. I thank God that there is a sacrifice that covers that. That we do not minister like we should. We don't take care of uh, winning souls like we should. And thank God that God will forgive us. Amen. And I think about in my own life. Instead of trying to apply it to your life. But years ago there was a man that came from California. And I was working at uh, Servco. Smith International Servco. And I was working in the back shop area. And uh, I was Training him how to weld, and I'm not going to get into details about what I welded, but 
I would, it was my job to train him coming from California to weld certain things. They call them jigs. And uh, so he came over and I was training him how to use a MIG welder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And how to do certain things. Well, I didn't witness to that man. And the whole time he was here, I felt in my spirit that God was saying to me, you need to, to witness to this man. Okay, I didn't do it. You know, normally I'm pretty bold about witnessing. But so I don't know why at that point I did not witness to this man. So trained him, whatever. He got on the plane. He went back home to California. And not too much longer after that, I heard that that man had died. Wow. How do you handle that kind of guilt? That probably the last person that, that had the truth that could win him to Jesus Christ with the saving gospel could have been me. And I didn't do my job. And when I, went, when I heard that, I felt guilty. I felt like I had failed. And I went before God Almighty and I said, God, forgive me for not witnessing to that man. That man died and no doubt he was lost. And I was the last one who maybe could have spoke to him about how to be saved. And so instead of letting guilt overwhelm me and overtake me, I remembered this story. How that God provided a sacrifice to cover even that blood guiltiness. Amen. I wasn't directly involved in his death. I didn't murder him. But I still became responsible. Because I was the one that was closest to him. Therefore I must make atonement for that sin. And I went before God. And I asked God to forgive me of that sin. Because I want you to know brothers and sisters. When I got that news. It hit me really really hard. Because I knew that God had been speaking to me and nudging me to witness to him. And I didn't do it. I was the closest one to him. So God says, I'm going to measure from that, the distance of that man's soul to you. And you become responsible for his soul. Amen. And so I had to say, God, would you forgive me for not witnessing to that man? And now he's dead and he's in eternity. So we have to understand the way that God looks at life, the way He looks at a human being. Every human being on this planet is very important to God because they were created in His image. And we have a responsibility to win souls. How is it that we can rub shoulders with people on a daily basis and we're not moved by the fact that they're dying and going to hell? And God says, I hold you responsible for what happened. Even though you didn't do it directly. Because you didn't do anything to, to, to fix the problem. Amen. And so what, what we're going to have to do is. We have to understand how serious this is. That we are so winners. That we've got a stewardship from God. And God has called us to do it. And I think it would be good if you would look at your life. And you would see all the opportunities. Or talk to God and say God. Show me all the opportunities that I had. To be a soul winner, to be to witness to somebody, and I kept my mouth shut, and I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Lord, I now realize by this passage that I need you to forgive me for that. I need a sacrifice to cover that blood guiltiness. I don't want to stand before God on judgment day, and he said, that one's blood is on your hands. So when it comes to soul winning and, and people's lives, especially eternal life, we have a stewardship. We may be the closest church, the closest city, the closest individual to somebody that perishes. Okay? So let's take it very, very serious. Amen? God moves on your heart, moves on your spirit to witness somebody. Do not quench that spirit. Okay? Amen? Praise the Lord. And so it's important for us as a church as well that... We maintain our walk with God the way we should so that we'll be a light for people to come to. And if we fail in that area, if, we, if I fail in my ministry, if you fail in your ministry, it's a big deal with God. Because you're dealing with people's lives. Okay? Amen? As a pastor, when I look at this passage, I think about the responsibility that is on the ministry, the pastor. For the lives of the people that they minister to. They might not kill them directly. But have they killed them indirectly? 
Are they responsible? Amen. So it's a very serious thing when we're, what we're involved with. Amen. So let's learn from this passage. On judgment day, we may find out that God says, you know, I measured your church and your church was the closest one. And you didn't witness and they perished and they died. Okay. Thank God, though. I really believe that that would be reason enough for us to die and go to hell. But the mercy and grace of God because of his sacrifice steps in and says, I covered even that. Amen. Take your soul winning very serious. We must do that. So what God is showing you then is that even an unsolved murder. It's the responsibility of the city. Or the, the closest city to that murder. The unsolved murder. To make sure it's, it's covered. It's atoned for. Because God values life. That's the point. The next story we see a story that's very unusual. It's a story about a captive woman. And the picture is that God has sent the nation into battle. God has directed the nation of Israel to fight a war. And we've already covered this in the previous uh, chapter, chapter 20. How that God's the one who directs battles. We preached that last Wednesday night. And so we see in these verses to follow, 10 through 14. We see that God is sending the nation of Israel into war, into battle. And God says, whenever those nations are defeated by His people, again, under the direction of the Spirit of God to go to war, He says, if one of the Israelite men see a woman of that other nation that has been defeated, and that Israelite soldier sees her beauty, and the Bible says he desires her, he wants her for himself. Now, I don't want you to think about that. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 7, God had already said that you do not intermarry. But now God gives the approval for the Israelite soldier to marry somebody that's not a part of Israel. But there's no contradiction in the Bible. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 7, and I don't have time to turn there, you're going to see the reason why God says don't intermarry is not based on ethnicity. He's not saying that, you know, somebody with a different, different ethnic background can't get married. He's saying don't marry somebody that's not in the same faith. He said because they will turn your heart away from the truth. So what God forbids is not ethnic intermarriage. But faith in a marriage. He forbids that. So read Deuteronomy 7. So there's no contradiction in the word of God. So we come here now and we see a man, an Israelite man, sees a, uh, a woman of another nation, a different ethnicity, ethnicity. And they win the fight. And this man, this Israelite soldier, sees how beautiful she is. And God says, it's okay for an Israelite man in that situation to take that woman from another nation and take her into his house okay you understand so there's no contradiction in the word of God now but the Bible says that God gives some specific stipulations on this arrangement so the Israelite man sees this beautiful woman of another nation God gives him the authority to take her into his house and literally the Bible says that uh, he goes into her. Okay? Now, the Hebrew language is not bashful about intimacy. Okay? So let me read it to you so uh, you can see what I'm saying. When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thy hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to wife, then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall have her head and pair, she shall shave her head and pair her nails. She shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thy house, and be well her father and her mother a full month after that thou shalt go into her, is the literal Hebrew. After a month, he, he says, when you get married, then you can go in, into her, literally. So the Hebrew language is not bashful about intimacy. But it has to be in relationship. It has to be in the marriage covenant. Okay? 
And so this is the, the stipulations. Then the Bible says in verse uh, continue and be her, her husband and she shall be thy wife. It shall be if they have no delight in her, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will, but thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her because thou hast humbled her. Okay, so let's break it down. So the Israelite man sees this beautiful woman of a different ethnicity. God defeats that nation in battle. The Israelite man sees this beautiful woman. He wants to marry her. So God says, that's fine. I give you the permission to do that. Okay? He says, but here's what has to be done. You're going to take her into your house. You want her, you desire, you're going to take her into your house. That means that you're going to show her dignity. When he takes her into his house, that means he's responsible to provide for her, to feed her, to protect her. Even though she was a captive woman, when he takes her into his house, he's responsible to show a captive woman dignity. So he's going to protect her and he's going to provide for her and he's going to treat her with dignity even before he marries her. And then God says that she is going to be allowed to mourn for 30 days before the Israelite man can marry her. So God says that this woman, this captive woman, who's going to be married to an Israelite man is going to have to do four things. Number one, shave their head. Number two, trim their nails. Number three, remove the garments of their captivity. And number four, mourn. Okay? And after that 30 days, then the Israelite man can marry her so that now she is no longer to be treated as a captive woman. She's to be treated as a wife in Israel. With all the dignity of life that should be given to her. The protection, the provision that now this captive woman is now a wife. She's no longer seen as a captive woman. And this man is to protect her and provide for her and show her dignity. Amen. Right? Because she has gone through a transformation. She's gone through a time of transition. She's got, got rid of the indicators of her previous culture. Which also connects her with her previous worship of false deities. So when she shaves her head and cuts her nails and removes the garments of her captivity. What she's doing is she is getting rid of her old identity. The old life that she used to live. The old culture she was a part of. And she is no longer going to live like that. Like a captive woman. She's going to get rid of all of those indicators of what she used to be. And now she's going to be recognized as an Israelite wife, a part of the family of God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, spiritually speaking, the way that applies to us is that we were once in the world. We were heathens. And we were captured. We were captured by the love of Jesus Christ. And when we were captured, we got rid of our old identity. Of the old life, the old way we used to dress, the old way we used to live. We got rid of all of that. We no longer worship that false God we were under. And we became the wife of Jesus Christ. With a brand new identity. No longer a slave. No longer a captive. But a wife of Jesus Christ with dignity. Amen. Does everybody understand that? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I can preach a message just on that right there. And I think you can apply it to, in your own life about how you used to be, but now who you are. You've got rid of the old garments of captivity. Yeah, 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 yeah. How, you remember how you used to dress before you got in the church? You got rid of those garments of captivity. You got rid of those things that identify you with the culture of this world. And you started living as a bride of Jesus Christ. And so this woman now is going to be treated as a, a wife, not as a captive woman. She's going to be treated with dignity and respect. She's going to be provided for and protected. Hallelujah. And so what God is showing you here is this, is the dignity 
of a woman. And the importance of the, the man, because in the picture, this soldier, obviously he has much more authority than a captive woman. Right? But what God is saying to this soldier who has authority, when you take her into your house, you provide, protect her, etc. You give her this time to relocate, if you will, her identity. And get rid of all that other stuff that she used to live in. And become your wife. 